Amen. So keep your place in Revelation chapter 15. We'll get there in just a few minutes. But we're starting a new sermon series tonight. It's called, um, the sermon series is called God's Numbers. And in the Mother's Day um, sermon, we looked at 2 Kings chapter 4, the story of the Shunammite woman and how um, the prophet, you know, raised up her son um, from the dead. And uh, Jacob, if you want to go ahead and turn there, um, we'll look at that real, real quickly. And I mentioned during that sermon that um, it's important to one of the points I made in this sermon is how important it is to sit down and uh, read the Bible um, with your children. And, and uh, one of the reasons I said that is because your children, uh, many times you, what you'll find is they will ask you questions about the Bible, many times questions that you never thought about or you never, um, you know, they have a different perspective. They have a, kids have like a pure perspective when it comes to looking at the Bible. So many times they'll ask you questions that you're not ready for. And um, I got a question um, that was along those lines. Um, I wasn't ready to answer this whole question. I gave a one um, sentence answer and then said I would basically start a sermon series about it. But look down at 2 Kings chapter 4 and look at verse number 34. Jacob asked this question about two hours after I preached that sermon. Look at verse number 34 of 2 Kings chapter 4. This is about um, Elisha raising up this child of the Shunammite woman from the dead. And he went up and he lay upon the child and put his mouth upon his mouth and his eyes upon his eyes and his hands upon his hands and stretched himself upon the child and the flesh of the child waxed warm. Of course, this is the child that died from the farming accident and um, Elisha, she came to Elisha for help. Then he returned and walked in the house to and fro and went up and stretched himself upon him and the child sneezed seven times and the child opened his eyes. And he called Gehazi and said, call this Shunammite. So he called her and she was come, when she was come into him, he said, take up thy son. So the question was, um, actually it was more of a statement. It wasn't, um, yeah, it was a question, but basically, basically Jacob asked the question. He said, he said, dad, I know that everything in the Bible means something and there's nothing in the Bible that's there on accident. So why did the child sneeze seven times? So that's kind of where um, this sermon series came from, God's number. So I gave him a quick answer that I'm going to give you in just a few minutes on what that seven means, but then I'll kind of dive deeper into the story towards the end of the sermon. So we're looking at God's numbers, numbers in the Bible that have meaning for this sermon series. The first number we're going to look at is the number seven. And the number seven is all over the Bible. The number seven is all over the Bible from Genesis to especially Revelation. It just pops up everywhere. So I'm going to explain that to you this evening. It's, it's in so many places in the Bible, we literally can't go to all the places in the Bible to look at the number seven. But I'm going to show you what the number seven means tonight. And, and everywhere you see the number seven, what I tell you tonight will apply. All right. So look at Genesis chapter 2. First of all, Genesis chapter 2. Let's start at the beginning. We'll come back to this story about the Shunammite and what that means um, a little bit later um, towards the end. But look at Genesis chapter 2. Let's look at the number 7 in the Bible and get to the bottom of what this means. So, of course, um, actually go to Genesis chapter 2 and let's just look at verse number 1. We're looking at the number 7 and what it means in the Bible. So it's too many times to cover everything in the Bible. So we're going to look at the beginning of the Bible, we'll look at the end of the Bible. I'll tell you what it means, and then we'll go deeper into it um, in a little bit. Look at verse uh, number one of Genesis chapter two. We're looking at the number seven, all right? Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in, in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. So remember, you know, the creation itself, the work was done in six days, all right? And it was on the seventh day that God rested and he sanctified, he sanctified it. He blessed the seventh day, he sanctified it because in it he rested from all his work. Now go to Revelation chapter 15. I should have told you to keep your place there. But the point is, the creation, we consider the creation to be seven days, including that day of rest on day number seven. All right, so God rest, rested, he sanctified the seventh day, and he blessed um, the seventh day uh, with, with just resting and looking back 
at the creation that he had done. Look at Revelation chapter 15, look at verse number 1. Now at the end of the Bible, we see the number 7 um, coming up again and again and again. I could have chosen almost any chapter in Revelation, but I chose Revelation chapter 15 um, because it kind of wraps up you know, um, one of the last things that God uses the number seven for. He says, And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues. For in them is filled up the wrath of God. So the Bible here is saying is that these angels, they hold um, the last plagues, and in these, um, in these plagues are the entire wrath of God. All right, the entire wrath of God is contained in how many plagues? In these seven plagues. Plagues. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass having the harps of God. So these um, people are in heaven at this point, and they sing the song of Moses, the service, servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. So we're looking at saints that are in heaven at this point, and the rapture has already happened in Revelation chapter 14. And we're looking for what comes right after the rapture. It's the pouring out of God's wrath. All right, look at verse number 4. Who shall not fear me, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou art, o art ho only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee. For thy judgments are made manifest. And after that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues, as we just saw in the verse 1, clothed in purple and white linen, and having their breasts girded with golden girdles. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full. So this is how, these are, these are the containers um, that are holding those plagues, holding that plague full of what? Full of the wrath of God, who liveth forever and ever. And the temple, the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. So it wasn't fulfilled. This wasn't over. The wrath of God wasn't over until all seven vials were poured out. All right? All seven plagues were poured out. So we see from creation at the beginning to the wrath of God at the end, the number seven is picturing completeness or perfection. All right, that's what the number seven in the Bible is, is picturing. All right, go back to, um, actually, you go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And now that we know that, if we look at creation, we look at creation and we see that the seven days of creation included this rest day, included this blessing day. To, to be complete. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. It's not just six days and then, you know, the seventh, it was just like a vacation day. It was like, no, there was a reason for that seventh day. That seventh day was important. And we can apply that to ourselves in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse number 18. This is a good lesson for us here as Christians. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse number 18. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, it says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. So we can apply that to ourselves in the sense that, you know, we need to appreciate our blessings or they are not complete. You know, we need to take time in our lives on a regular basis to, you know, be thankful. I mean, the Bible talks about, you know, being thankful all the time. Being thankful is, being unthankful is a super serious sin. So we need to take time from, you know, our busy lives, our work, and, you know, that's why Sunday is such a great day. You know, Sunday is such a great day where we can just, you know, worship the Lord and fellowship with other believers and then, you know, um, you know break bread after, after Sunday night service. It's super important for us to do this, and it completes our week. Go to Psalm chapter 12. Let's look at more completeness, more perfection, um, using the number seven in the Bible. Look at verse uh, number six of Psalm chapter 12. So we see that God completed the creation. You know, he took that day to sanctify the whole thing, to bless the whole thing. The whole thing was complete after the seventh day. All right, same thing with the wrath of God. The whole thing was complete after the seventh vial. That's very symbolic and very important. Look at Psalm chapter 12. 
How about this one that uses the number seven to be complete and perfect? You think about the things that we need to have complete and perfect in our lives. What's the most important thing that we need to have complete and perfect in our lives? It's the Bible. It's the Word of God. You say, well, is the Word of God complete? Yes, it is. Look at Psalm chapter 12 and verse number six. The Bible says the words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Now, you see how that important, that number seven is important? You see how the, the number seven is important? Knowing that seven means completion, seven means perfection. Because what are we told by a lot of cults and false religions today? It's, I mean, pretty much every cult, I think, is basically coming up with some new revelation. It's some leader or personality that comes out and says, I have a new revelation from God. Or there's extra biblical, you know, information put in. You know, it's very easy to just twist what's actually in the Bible because nobody knows what the Bible says anymore. But a very popular and common thing is for, you know, some false prophet to try to add to the Word of God. I mean, look at Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith, I mean, literally just had, you know, it's literally called, the Book of Mormon is literally called, like, I think it's called another revelation of Jesus Christ. I mean, that whole church, that whole religion teaches that up until that point where that false prophet found these plates or whatever it was, this extra revelation, that, like, Christianity was lost up until that point. But the Bible is saying, I mean, that flies right in the face of Psalm 12, 6. God says, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from what? This generation forever. We're not going to lose the word of God. And guess what? There's a lot of people that say, you know, take that purified seven times and apply it to the King James Bible and how the King James Bible was developed. And I'm not against that. But the most important thing about this verse is that the Bible is complete and perfect. It is done. There is no other revelation. As a matter of fact, God ends the Bible in Revelation chapter 22 by saying, hey, if you add to it or you take away from it, you're done. You're not going to heaven. You're not going to be saved. That's, what, that's how serious God is about it. Look, there is no extra revelation. I mean, that would solve a lot of problems if people knew that today. All right? But that's the importance of that number seven in you know psalm chapter 12 it just shows it's complete it's perfect it's done all right how about jesus go to john chapter 6. john chapter 6. jesus in the number seven all over the place but there's a there's a bigger picture here so i'll just give you a few of these um, these smaller examples of jesus in uh, and the number seven and and then we'll look at like the bigger picture of jesus and the number seven in the book of John, there's the I am statements of Jesus. Jesus is coming and he's saying, you know, I am these things. And there's seven of those statements. There's seven of these statements where Jesus says in John chapter 6, 35, he says, I am, he, Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth on me shall never thirst. In John chapter 8, you go to John chapter 10. You go to John chapter 10. I'll read for you John 8, 12. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. In John chapter 10, in verse number 7, Jesus says, I am the door. In John chapter 10, in verse number 11, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, matching exactly Psalm chapter 23, where it says, the Lord is my shepherd. John chapter 11, verse 25, you don't have to turn there. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And the number 7, I am statement in the Bible is John 15, in chapter, or in verse number one, where he says, I am the true vine. So there just happens to be seven of these statements where Jesus says, I am. There's, uh, how many statements did Jesus say on the cross? There's seven statements in the Bible with Jesus speaking on the cross. Go to Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15. So the number seven is all over the Bible, and it's all over Jesus' ministry as well. Look at Matthew chapter 15 and verse number 32. Matthew chapter 15 and verse number 32. The Bible says in verse 32, Jesus called his disciples unto them and said, I have compassion on the multitude because they continue with me now three days and they have nothing to eat. And I will not send them away fasting lest they faint in the way. 
And his disciples say unto him, Whence should we have not so much bread in the wilderness as to fill so great a multitude? And Jesus said, How many loaves are there? And they said, Seven, and a few little fishes. And he commanded the multitude to sit down on the ground, and he took the seven loaves and fishes and gave thanks and break it and gave it to his disciples and the disciples to the multitude. And they did all eat and were filled, and they took up the broken, uh, broken meat that were left, seven baskets full. And they did eat, were 4,000 men besides women and children. When, he, when Jesus fed the 5,000, so this was the feeding of the 4,000. In Luke chapter 9, when he fed the 5,000, there was five loaves and two fishes, seven. <laughs> just, you know, showing just the completeness of what was needed from Jesus. It was complete. It was enough, is what the Bible is telling us here. Like I said, Jesus had, um, Jesus had seven statements on the cross. Now, these are just kind of like little examples of the number seven. But what's the big number seven for Jesus? Go to Leviticus chapter 16. So we know from past sermons that the Day of Atonement, Leviticus chapter 16, it details this great sacrifice that they were to do every year with the Day of Atonement with uh, the bull and two goats and this, it's this, this whole detailed thing. And we know that Jesus pictures the entire thing. So the entire Day of Atonement sacrifice was picturing Jesus, all right? So you say, what part of the Day of Atonement was Jesus? All of it is the answer, all right? Look at verse number 14 of Leviticus chapter 16. The Bible says in verse number 14, it says, he shall take the blood of the bullock. So this is the, the bullock was for the high priest and the goats were for the people. He says, he shall take the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it with his finger upon the mercy seat eastward and before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle of the blood with his finger seven times. Then shall he shall kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people and bring his blood from within the veil that the blood he did of the blood sprinkled upon the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. And he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions and all their sins. So shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation that remaineth among them in the midst of their uncleanness. Verse 17. And there shall be no man in the tabernacle of the congregation when he goeth in to make atonement in the holy place until he come out and have made an atonement for himself and for his household and for all the congregation of Israel. And he shall go out unto the altar that is before the Lord and make an atonement for it. And he shall take the blood of the bullock and the blood of the goat and put it upon the horns of the altar round about. And he shall sprinkle the blood upon it with his finger seven times and cleanse it and hallow it from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. This is symbolizing, turn to Hebrews chapter 12. This is symbolizing that number seven, when he sprinkled the blood on the altar, this was symbolizing the completeness of the blood atonement of Jesus Christ. That's what this was picturing. You say, why seven times? Because the number seven symbolizes completeness or perfection. Now that, look, that sacrifice in Leviticus chapter 16 was not perfect or complete. It was just a picture of the perfect sacrifice to come. But that's why they did things in such a specific way, because they were picturing, they were shadowing what the actual perfect sacrifice was going to be. Look at Hebrews chapter 10 and verse number 1. The Bible explains this for us here. It says, For the law, having a shadow of good things to come. See, meaning, Leviticus chapter 16, the law, the Old Testament, is shadowing Christ. The whole Old Testament is pointing to Jesus, folks. The shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. Those sacrifices only pictured the perfect sacrifice. Those sacrifices didn't save the people. Okay? For then they would not have ceased to be offered. He's saying... I mean, this is such a great picture of eternal salvation and the, the once sacrifice of Jesus. For then, would they not have ceased to be offered? It's like, why would they have to do it every year if it was a perfect sacrifice? Because that the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible, this is really the key right here, it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Those 
sacrifices in Leviticus chapter 16 and all over the New Te or Old Testament did not take away the people's sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book that is written of me, the, the law, the Old Testament, to do thy will, O God. Above when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for the sin thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which we are sanctified. This is the New Testament right here. All right? By the which we, by the which, by the which, which will, we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So all that stuff did was picture the perfect sacrifice, and what a better way to do it than use this number seven that symbolizes completion and perfe perfection. The high priest, you know, they just were just symbolizing this thing that Christ actually accomplished himself through his body. Turn to Revelation chapter one. Let's look at another one. Now this one's a little, uh, this one's a little deep, all right? This one's a little deep, and there's some weird stuff on this one out there. But um, it's, it's really not that complicated if we just look at what the Bible says, as with most things. Look at Revelation chapter 1. Let's look at another 7 in the Bible. Another 7 in the Bible. Look at Revelation chapter 1, verse number 4. The Bible says, John to the seven churches. Well, first of all, how many letters were there? There were seven. There were seven churches which are in Asia. Grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins with his own blood. Go to Revelation chapter 3. So there's this mention of these seven spirits of God. So what is that all about? Look at Revelation chapter 3 and verse number 1. Revelation chapter 3 and verse number 1. Now, if you have a red letter Bible, the, the letters to the seven churches are all, I mean, Revelation chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 3 are all red words, if you have a red letter Bible, because it's Jesus speaking to the churches. Jesus is literally, you know, giving this counsel to these seven churches, which means it's pretty good, you know, complete um, counsel to these churches. Look at verse number 1 of Revelation chapter 3. And under the angel, all that to say that Jesus is the one speaking. And under the angel of the church in Sardis write, these things saith he... So who's saying this? This is talking about Jesus right here. Okay, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know thy works, that thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. So Jesus is speaking, and here the Bible is saying that Jesus hath the seven spirits of God. All right? Look at Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5. So I mean these seven spirits of God. Look at Revelation chapter 5, verse number 6. Revelation 5 and verse number 6. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain, that's of course Jesus, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. So the lamb has these seven horns and seven eyes, which again, it mentions the seven spirits of God. So the Bible here is mentioning that Jesus has these seven spirits of God. So I mean, what, what is this? Is like, are, are, we, are we getting rid of the Trinity here and going to like a, like a nine-part God here? I mean, what's going on? All right, let's look at this. Um, look at Isaiah chapter 11 to find out what this is all about. I mean, it's definitely something. I mean, it comes up, you know, talking about these seven spirits in Revelation and that Jesus has them. All right, look at Isaiah. Go to Isaiah chapter 11. Go to Isaiah chapter 11, and we're going to look at verse, I guess we'll start in verse number 1. So Isaiah chapter 11, in, in the first couple of verses here, it's, a, it's clearly a prophecy of Jesus Christ. It's clearly talking about Jesus Christ. All right, so in uh, Isaiah chapter 11, look at verse number 1, and you'll see what I'm talking about. It says, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, 
and a branch shall grow out of his roots. So, of course, Jesse was David's father, David's father. And, of course, we know that Jesus Christ came from the line of David, fulfilling that messianic prophecy that, you know, um, David was given by the prophet Nathan. All right? So, you know, that's when, remember when David was, um, he was mourning, you know, his sin, and he was, his son was sick, and, you know, his son died, and then he wanted to build the temple, and basically Nathan said, you're not going to build the temple, your son's going to build the temple, and then he gives him that messianic prophecy that the Messiah is going to come from you, you know, your kingdom shall go into eternity. That's that prophecy that was fulfilled through Jesus Christ. But now look at verse number two. The Bible says, and the Spirit, now it's talking about Jesus, talking about in Isaiah, talking about the coming Messiah. These are, this is a great prophecy about Jesus. It says, the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Now we'll, you know, assume, you know, that's the Holy Spirit, right? The Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. If you count all those things up, including the Spirit of the Lord, you're looking at seven things right there. All right, so that is, those are the spirits of God. Now turn to Matthew chapter 3. So you say, when did Jesus get this? The Bible says that he's going to get the spirit of the Lord. The, the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. And then he's going to get this spirit of wisdom and understanding and counsel and might and the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. So that is, look, that is what the seven spirits of God are. What the seven spirits of God are, here's how I kind of look at it. They're, they're like characteristics of God, basically. And look, there's seven of them. It's kind of a, there's seven characteristics or seven attributes of God. That's how I, I look at the seven spirits of God. It's not like there's, you know, we're, we're not busting up the Trinity here, okay? One of the seven spirits of God that Jesus was going to get was literally the Holy Spirit, is what it, it talks about here. It says the spirit of the Lord. Look at Matthew chapter 3, and this is when this happens. The Bible tells us when, you know, the Holy Spirit, you know, it's like Jesus being filled with the Spirit here. Look at Matthew chapter 3 and verse 16. So basically, if you want to think about it this way, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is kind of the mechanism that gave Jesus these other, you know, characteristics of God. You know, it's kind of the, the conduit that God used to give that to Jesus, all right? It, it's kind of where he received that fullness from. Not that he wasn't God already, okay? Don't get me wrong. He was already God already, but he was kind of filled with these characteristics at this point. Look at verse 16. This is what Isaiah chapter 2, or 11, verse number 2 is talking about. It says, when Jesus was baptized, he went up straight, straight away out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened up to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, and lighting upon him, and lo, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And then, of course, what happens right after this? If you look at Matthew chapter 4, it says Jesus was what? He was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted. And then, of course, right after he was led by the Spirit to be tempted 40 days by Satan, what does he do? He starts his ministry and he starts calling disciples. All right, so God basically brought down the seven spirits of God through the conduit of the Holy Spirit onto Jesus so he could start his ministry. Jesus was already God before that. We say, why is there seven? Why is there seven? Go to, um, actually, we'll get to that in just, just a minute. Actually, go to Colossians chapter 2. We almost read this today when we read the whole thing. But go to Colossians chapter 2. Go to Colossians chapter 2. Let me just complete this idea of these spirits of God. All right, so Revelation talks about the seven spirits of God, Jesus having the seven spirits of God. Isaiah chapter 11 says that Jesus is going to get the seven spirits of God. One of those is the spirit of the Lord. In Matthew chapter 3, we see Jesus, the Holy Spirit coming down upon Jesus. The seven spirits are just the seven characteristics, or maybe you could call them gifts that came, you know, characteristics or attributes maybe of God that came upon Jesus before he started his ministry. And it's just kind of a complete picture of God. But you're sitting, now you say, well, the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It wasn't Jesus just the Son? But see, no, he wasn't. Not in that sense. Look at Colossians chapter 2 and look at verse number 9. So Jesus was the Son. 
And the Son is not the Father, and the Son is not the Holy Spirit. As we see the Holy Spirit come upon God. But this is where, you know, people get all wacky. All right? But here's what you have to understand about the Trinity. Okay? The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, it's not like, that's why anybody that gets up and draws a graph or puts up an egg or something, they're always going to end up being wrong because there's really no analogy that really covers this well. All right? You can't really take, you know, a pie and, you know, say Jesus is a third God and the Father's a third God and the Holy Spirit's a third God because of Colossians chapter 2 and verse number 9 and really because of Isaiah chapter 11 and verse number 2 and Matthew chapter 3. I mean, really, look at verse number 2. It says, for in him, talking about Jesus, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. It's saying Jesus was 100% God. You say, I don't understand that. Here's the thing you have to understand. You don't have to understand everything. I mean, sometimes we just got to kind of stop and just say, so Jesus was not one-third God. Jesus was all God. And that's what it's saying. That's what the Bible is basically saying when it says the seven spirits were given to him, meaning he was the full, he was fully man and he was fully God. But he was just the son, but he was fully God. I don't understand that. Well, you know, I don't really understand it either. But, you know, maybe that's when I'll tap Jesus on the shoulder and say, hey, you know, what's the mechanics of that when I get to heaven? I don't really have to understand all the complicated things that, you know, are beyond, like, human understanding. You know, this is God stuff. This is like, this is like, you know, when we start talking about these types of things, God told us these, there's seven spirits. He told us what the seven spirits were. He told us what Jesus was given in Matthew chapter 3, and he started, I mean, it makes sense to me. It makes sense to me if you look at the things that he was given in Isaiah chapter 11. You know, you got a guy that's starting his ministry, and he's got wisdom and understanding and counsel and might and knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Those seem like things that would be pretty valuable for someone that's going to go and, and do a, a ministry on earth for three years before they, you know, sacrifice themselves on the cross. So it makes sense why those things were given to him. It makes sense that those are kind of a picture of God. Now, how the, the fullness of God was in Jesus and the fullness of God exists in Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit, you know, I mean, I don't need to try to just make a bunch of stuff up. Let's put it that way. You know, so these three are one. And, you know, Jesus had the seven spirits, and they're listed for us. And it makes sense how, you know, those things would be necessary for an earthly ministry. All right? How about this one? Go, to, um, go back to Revelation. Let's go to Revelation chapter uh, 6. Go to Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6. God's wrath. God's wrath and the book of Revelation regarding God's wrath the number seven is everywhere. I mean, you think about it. You got Daniel's 70 weeks, right? You got Daniel's 70 weeks, of which we are waiting for what? We're somewhere in between the 69th week. We're waiting for the start of the 70th week, right? At the midst of that 70th week, you know, we've got, well, at the beginning of the 70th week, we've got the seven seals that are opened, right? In between the sixth and the seventh seal is going to be the rapture at that point. And right after that, right after the rapture, is when, you know, we see in Revelation chapter 6, look at verse 17, it says, For the great day of his wrath is come, who shall be able to stand? Talking about, this is talking about, you know, God's wrath starting. And then what do we see? We see the seven vials. We see the seven trumpets that basically announce, you know, each vial. That the trumpets and the vials match up in the Bible. Then we see the seven spirits of God. We see... All these things, you know, in Revelation with the sevens. It just shows you the completion and the perfection of God's wrath. In Romans chapter 12, and verse number 9, I'll just read it for you. It says, Dearly beloved, this is why we really don't have to worry. You say, you know, why is it important that God's wrath is complete and it's perfect? Why do I need to know that? You need to know that because in Romans 12, 9, it says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourself. Avenge not yourself, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. You notice how it said the word wrath there. You know what God is saying in Revelation, in Revelation 15, Revelation 6 and 7, and all over the Bible when God is pouring out his wrath through the trumpets 
in the vials, and he's telling us in, in Romans chapter 12, verse number 9, he's saying, no, no, no. He's like, I, I literally just talked to a guy out soul winning about this today. It's like, look, we don't have to worry about this stuff. We don't have to worry about who's getting away with what and so-and-so did something. We don't have to worry about Jeffrey Dahmer getting saved. Okay? I mean, we don't have to worry. Look, a lot of people are hung up about this. The reprobate doctrine is so important, it's ridiculous. And look, it's one, of the, it's one of the stupid things Christians believe. Christians believe today. It's just like, oh, you know, anybody can get saved. It, look, it hangs people up from getting saved. It hangs people up from the gospel. It hangs people up because people are like, oh, you're telling me I could just... The guy literally said today, you sound, tell me some guy can go into a school and shoot up 27 kids and then just trust in Jesus and he'll just go to heaven. No. That's not what the Bible teaches. And that person that did that, because look, normal, natural people do not struggle with that type of thing. We are all sinners, I told this guy. I'm a sinner, you're a sinner, I have foolish thoughts all the time. You know, we're going to be sinners till the day that we die. But you know what? I mean, like, oh man, you know, going and shooting up a bunch of innocent people, that's not something that a normal person struggles with. Something has happened there, and the Bible tells us what happened in Romans chapter 1. It's very clear, but we don't have to worry about it because God is telling us in the Bible, through this Bible study that I'm showing you, that, hey, my wrath will be complete. My wrath will be perfect. And that's what he's saying. He's saying, avenge not yourselves. He's like, let that, let that give place unto wrath. And what? It's perfect, complete wrath. And that's why you see with that wrath, it's seven, 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 everywhere. Because it's going to be perfect. It's going to be complete. God's not going to, everybody that's got something coming is going to get theirs. That's what it boils down to. Except us. Because we're not going to get ours because we've trusted on Jesus. And we are going to be covered in that once for all perfect, complete sacrifice of Jesus Christ. But everybody else is going to get what's coming. God's like, I mean, how silly it is. I mean, look, I get it. I mean, I understand the, the anger of someone that would have lost somebody or had somebody hurt to somebody that was wicked or, or, or you know, some terrible person that was a murderer or worse. But God is just saying, look, it's going to be perfect. It's going to be complete. And look, it's important. It is important that people know that. It is important to know that God has the ball on this one. All right? There's all kinds of other sevens in the Bible. There's seven lamps of fire in Revelation chapter 4. Again, there's seven churches in Asia that God's talking to in Revelation chapter 2, chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 7, there's seven of the clean beasts. It's not just, they weren't just two by two. The clean beast, there were seven pairs of each um, kind of animals. Leviticus chapter 25, seven times seven for the years brought you to the, the 49th year and into the year of Jubilee, which was to, you know, reset things and kind of forgive people their debts. In Job chapter 2, this one's interesting. They sat down, it says Job chapter 2 and verse 13, I'll just read for you. It says, so they sat down with him upon the ground. You know, Job just lost everything. He just lost everybody, just lost everything. They sat down with him upon the ground seven days and seven nights for his, um, and none spake a word unto him, for they saw his grief was very great. So he had seven days and seven nights of what? Of mourning. You know, so he, he, it took him seven days and seven nights to complete his mourning process, right? Now go back to 2 Kings chapter 4, and we'll finish up here. So we just see that, that just the Bible, I mean, you know, Jacob was right. Jacob was right. Nothing is in the Bible by accident. So when you see things like this, where there's this, you know, Elisha comes and he raises this boy from the dead. He raises this boy from the dead. And all of a sudden this boy, he sneezes seven times. And you just know, just like, what does that mean? You know, what does that mean? And then you start looking into this and you see that it actually meant something. And look. Just as the sacrifice, sacrifices of the Old Testament pictured the, the perfect sacrifice to come. The boy sneezing seven times, it pictures the Messiah to come. It pictures the perfect resurrection is what it pictures. So as this boy, look, this boy being raised from the dead is just, 
if it was just this boy being raised from the dead and we didn't have this little piece in the Bible, this is the beauty in the, the infinite nature of the Bible. If we didn't have this detail where it says he sneezed seven times, it'd just be some miracle in the Bible. But instead, he sneezes seven times and he's resurrected and it shows like, oh, here's a resurrection in the Old Testament. But you know what Jesus' resurrection was? It was the perfect resurrection. Because without the resurrection, you know, we have no hope for our resurrection. Because Jesus' perfect resurrection is the first fruits showing that we will be resurrected as well. All right? Without the sneezing, it's just a, a miracle. That's the depth of the Bible. And that's why we need to look at these things and, you know, read the Bible to your kids. <laughs> you know, read the Bible to your kids. And, and it's just, uh, it's great the questions that they ask. But the number seven in the Bible, it's everywhere. Um, I feel like I didn't do it justice. It's all over the place. But it just shows you what God is telling us in the Bible in all these places. Instead of saying, instead of saying, hey, I'm going to preserve my word, he says, no, it's been purified seven times, meaning it's done, it's good, it's perfect, it's complete. Jesus' work, it's once for all, it's perfect, it's complete. My wrath will cover everything. It's perfect, it's complete. The creation, it's perfect, it's complete. By the way, seven, seven days, be thankful for the things that you have. Take a time, you know, take time to take a break and, and, and thank God every time that you eat. You know, that's what makes that meal complete. That's what makes that thing perfect when you appreciate and are thankful for the things that God did. So that's the number seven in the Bible. And every single time you read the number seven, that's the, that's the picture that God is trying to show you in that part of the Bible. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.